Ja. Здравствуйте. I am. Um, I learned Russian 25 years ago, right? Okay. So I can't really remember anything of it. I'm. I'm sorry to say. And I know that um, you speak Ukrainian and not Russian, but I guess it's pretty close, right? Okay. So. So if you talk about me behind my back, I might actually understand what you're saying, even though I can't speak to you. So be nice. All right. Okay. <laughs> Right, so it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I was in Ukraine in Crimea like in the early 90s and I haven't been back since then, so this is the first time in like 20, 20 years I'm here, so it's, it's really nice to be here again. And today the weather is nice, it's good. So um, well, I'm happy to be here and uh, I hope that uh, you're happy to be here too. But my name is Mark Seaman, as you can tell. If you care about Twitter, I care about Twitter a lot, I handle this plug. Always interesting to do things on Twitter while talks are going on. Um, the talk today here is about conventions, and uh, I should tell you right away, this is kind of a technical talk, so I hope that you don't mind watching lots of uh, C sharp code going over the screen. Um, that's what's going to happen. So, um, so that's basically the thing. So what I want to talk about is something called convention over configuration, and. Um, the concept is actually pretty easy to comprehend. So, um, with the, just the, like a lot of those things, things where the concept is easy to understand, the difficulties in applying the concept is actually in the details. So the devil in this is in the details that, that often happens. So what I really want to do is just spend a little bit of time talking about the concept itself, and we can spend about five or ten minutes talking about the concept. We shouldn't really have to spend more uh, than that about that. And then I'll just more or less use the rest of the talk to show you a lot of demos. Um, so the demo is going to be the same application that I'm going to evolve throughout the talk. I'm not going to do live coding, but we're going to look at live code. So I'll use a um, version control system to fast forward into my code. And we can navigate uh, through the code and see it running, but I'm not going to type because I don't have time for that. So basically, the, the, um, the, um, the demos fall in two categories. So most of the things we're going to talk about, we'll talk about what a DI container, dependency injection container can do to help us enable those con uh, conventions. And uh, we'll also see how unit tests can help us. So that's basically the plan for the next 50 minutes. So convention over configuration, um, what we want to do with that is we want to address the bureaucracy of um, writing software. So as .NET developers, at least, we, we're probably pretty good, I think most of you are probably pretty good at addressing all this bureaucracy that you have to um, maintain to make your application run correctly. So you have to, you have to edit configuration files, web, web config and app config. Uh, you probably have to put attributes in some of the classes that you create to make them play into the framework that you use. Um, maybe you have to implement the interfaces, write a little bit of infrastructure code, and so on. So there's a lot of stuff that we need to do to actually get our application up and running. And common to many of those configuration things is that we tend not to get feedback about whether or not we we define that configuration correctly until we actually try to run the application because the compiler doesn't give us feedback whether or not we wrote the XML configuration in a correct way, for example. So um, we want to cut down on that bureaucracy because it's a maintainability burden for us. And the business owners that ask us to write software don't really care about this infrastructure code. So it's just a liability to us more or less. So the more that we can actually cut down on that, the, the more efficient we can be. So, um, so what we want to do is we want to see if we can evolve our code into a set of mechanisms that kind of implement conventions around how we want to configure our application. So instead of having to write a lot of ad hoc configuration, we would have some consistent way of just doing things and, and we can write mechanisms that kind of enable those things to happen. Or maybe sometimes we can also write constraints that prevent something from happening. So when I'm talking about conventions here, I'm not talking about coding standards. So this is not a document that lives in 
you know, a, a Word document or a wiki page somewhere. Uh, the conventions that I'm talking about here is real code that's actually being executed. So it's a set of mechanisms or algorithms, if you want, that enable your applications to actually run with as, as little maintain, uh, maintenance uh, of the bureaucracy as possible. And, and basically, we talk about those mechanisms as, as falling into two different kind of categories. Um, we can write enabling conventions that enable something to happen. So that basically means if if the code that we write follows a certain set of conventions, which means it's consistent in the way that it does things, it's just going to work automatically because the convention is known and implemented and enabled by uh, mechanism. We can also write um, constraining conventions if we have a rule where we say, we don't want this thing to ever happening. It might be possible to write code in a specific way, but we don't want that to happen. We can write a little rule that kind of constrains ourselves, so, so if we ever inadvertently do that, um, we will get a warning about that. So we'll see examples of both. Mostly about the enabling stuff, because that sounds more positive, right? All right, okay, so that's, that's pretty much the concept. Um, so what I'm going to do here is just to start talking a little bit about um, a known case. So if you know about ASP.NET MVC, it has this thing called controllers. Um, so that's just the the ASP.NET MVC framework that Microsoft provides. So that's kind of we start with a known case just to, to see where we're going. Um, so let's just see what that looks like. I'm not going to spend too much time with that because you can see other resources on the internet that actually talk about how that works. Um, but it gives me a, an opportunity to introduce the sample application that we're actually looking at here. So first, let's establish a little bit of context. It's a very, very simple application. You can imagine this is a booking application for booking tables at a restaurant or buying tickets uh, for a concert, something like that. So what I have right now is just, um, this is just a UI. There's actually no backend wired up to this at the moment, but just to give you a, a sense of what's actually going on here, I can click on a date, I can type in my name, uh, email address, and uh, right now I can't really select any quantity because it's not wired up to any backend, but I, I can still press the save button and we get a little receipt here and uh, we can go back to the home page. That's, that's basically it is. Obviously it's supposed to kick off a lot of stuff in the back end that actually sends messages around, but that's, that's going to be wired up later on, not, not right now. Okay, so um, this is an ASP.NET MVC application and um, by default the ASP.NET MVC framework has a convention that says those controllers, uh, each controller is a class that handles HTTP requests and makes sure that, that this uh, request is handled and some uh, result is sent back, HTML or JSON or whatever you want to send back. And there's a very simple convention around a controller. Basically, it needs to implement an interface called iController. Uh, the easiest way to do that is just to derive from a class called controller. And if you do that, and just put it here in the controller's folder, it actually doesn't even need to be in the folder, but that's just um, what we normally do. Um, it's basically just been going to be picked up by the ASP.NET uh, MVC framework by itself, and you don't really have to do anything else to register that um, controller with the framework itself. It's just going to work, and if you want to add new controllers, you can just add new classes to this folder and just derive from the controller, and it's just automatically going to be available. So that's kind of a convention here. It's actually implemented by a mechanism inside the MVC framework that we can and we can change that mechanism if we need to, and we are going to need to do that when, when we move it on. Um, so that's that's uh, part of the convention. The other part of the convention is that the booking controller or all the controllers at the moment here must have a default constructor because otherwise the MVC framework is not going to understand how it's going to create instances of it. But that's basically it. So that's an example, it's a known example of how a convention actually works. You just create your controller classes and they're just automatically going to be picked up by the MVC framework and and uh, available for the application. You don't have to configure anything else. You don't have to write XML files or anything to tell the MVC framework that this, these things are there. All right, okay. So let's go on. So I want, what I want to do now is I, I want to fast forward this application to something that I call the, the total complexity. So it's kind of like this is, this is going to be the low point of the talk in terms of how the quality of the code looks like. Um, but this just, um, this just addresses what the type of problem that we want to, um, to address. So um, 
we're just going to shut down the application here for a moment and then I'll use git to fast forward. So I'll check out something called total complexity and reload the application. Mm. There we go. So what I have now, this, this application is, is basically the same one evolved as before, but it just um, has a lot of more code inside it. Um, basically, this is because now I've wired up all the back-end stuff. So actually, I don't have one, but I actually have two applications going on here right now. I have a background worker process that, that looks for um, messages on a persistent queue and, um, and picks them up and actually treats them when the application runs. So I'll just start this one up and I'll, I'll go back and I'll just show you how that would look. Um, start the other one. And basically the UI is still the same, but um, we should see a little bit of a difference now. If I go in here and try to make a reservation, I will now have a, a drop down with um, up, up, and up to the total uh, capacity of this specific date. And if I, uh, if I click save and then go back, I should hopefully see that the, um, that the date is disabled right now. We, so we have messages going back and forth in the back end actually make, taking care of recording that all of these things happened. Um, so probably not the most exciting demo you ever saw, um, but the um, exciting thing is actually about the code itself. So I'm just going to shut this down again. So to make all this work, I need to have a lot of services um, composed into the application. So, um, and I actually moved the controllers to, to a different library as well. So maybe I should stop debugging him. All right. There we go. Um, this so what we can see now is the booking controller actually lost the default constructor. Um, now I have a constructor that takes a lot of uh, dependencies as input, so that I have something called iReader or something, and I have something called iChannel of request reservation commands, things like that. So part of the convention I had to break because I had some other requirements in terms of the invariance of the controller classes that I, I want to implement. And um, when that happens, when I break the convention that the MVC framework knows about, I need to tell it explicitly how it, it's going to be able to um, compose an instance like this booking controller. So um, to enable to do that, I needed to write something called a poor man's composition route. And uh, this is very, very complex. So, so this is not, this is kind of the, the type of problem that we want to address. So when I talk about having a lot of ad hoc configuration in your software, this is what I'm talking about. So, so this is not the solution, right? This is the problem, okay? So basically I'm saying, well, if the requested controller type is of type of this type, I'll do this and, and so on. And specifically when I talk about the booking controller, it's, it's, it gets very complicated because the, creating the booking controller is, um, is happening down here, but it needs, some in, in, um, it needs some dependencies injected into it. And those dependencies need dependencies themselves and so on. So it gets really, really complicated. And if you think this looks complicated, then let's have a look at this uh, background worker thing. It's even worse. Uh, and uh, obviously, I did make this example kind of overcomplicated to po prove a point. Um, because when you look at how simple the application is, I could probably have, have done something that was less complicated. But the point is, we would tend to have a lot of very complicated configuration or setup of composition going on like this. And um, we really don't want to have to maintain all of this because this is pure infrastructure code. And we don't really want to have to deal with, with things like that. We want this thing to get out of our way and just work. So that's the goal that we want to achieve. And right now, we, we're not even close to, to doing something like that. All right, so that's the problem. Uh, let's see, what can we do? So first of all, we lost the, um, we lost the ability to just add controllers and, um, and have the MVC framework pick up those controllers automatically. And we want, we'd like to get that convention back. 
because it's not working at the moment. Let me go back and show you. The um, poor man's composition rule here, we have to make a, an if statement for each type of control that we have in the system at, uh, at the moment and explicitly tell MBC, the MBC framework how it's going to be composed. So, um, so every time we add a new type of control, we have to add a new if statement here. So that's, that's really ugly. So we want to get that ability back. So we want to have some kind of framework that can help us compose complex object graphs. And those frameworks already exist. They're called dependency injection containers or inversion of control containers. They compose object graphs. They're very, very good at doing that. So we can, um, we can define a convention that uses a DI container, in this case, Castle Windsor, um, just for example, uh, that gets us that convention back. So let me fast forward uh, in the code a little bit again and uh, to show you how that's going to look like. So I'll do a git checkout of, um, let's see, controllers. There we go. And I left the poor man's composition rule in place, but actually we're not going to look at this one anymore. It's just, um, it's not going to be used anymore. What we're really going to use is um, an other composition route that um, just wraps around Castle Windsor. So basically we just have this Windsor container here, and whenever we want to create an instance of a controller, we just ask the container to resolve that instance. So that's pretty easy. The hard part is actually defining how the dependency injection container is being um, configured. And luckily, most containers have a kind of an API to, to define conventions. So Castle Windsor, for example, has this fluid API that says, well, from the assembly that cont contains the home controller, just any assembly that we give it here, yeah, pick anything that's based on the iController interface and register that with the container. So it's just going to scan that assembly through and say everything that it finds that implements the iController interface, it's going to pick that up and, and register that with the container so that the container can understand how it's going to compose um, those things. So that's basically the same thing that we had before. Now we can just add controller classes to a specific assembly and the container is just automatically going to pick those up and, and, um, and be able to compose them. So, so that's, that kind of gives us that convention back. It comes at, at a cost though, because right now the cost is that we tell the dependency injection container how it should find all the controllers. But the controllers have dependencies, and those dependencies we haven't really, by convention, told the, the, the container how it should find all of those. So right now we have manual setup that, that defines how all of those work. So that's even almost even worse than it was before because now we have all this stuff going on here which is dependency injection container configuration code. Very, lots of, of ad hoc code going on right there. So, um, so we're not quite there yet. We, um, we need to do more stuff to get rid of all of this because this, this is just a different kind of maintenance that we need to do. Um, but basically, this is very typical dependency injection container configuration where we say something like, well, there is an interface called iReader of something and it's implemented by this class called file month view store. And by the way, um, this file month view store constructor has special constructor arguments that should be assigned as defined by these uh, method calls here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. So lots of ad hoc code still going on. While we got the, um, the convention about the controls back, we really um, pay a high cost of, of doing that. So, um, so we'll have to look at how we can make this uh, simpler by applying more conventions. Before we do that though, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about dependency, uh, dependency constraints or constraining conventions. So if you're an architect and you, um, or a lead developer and you think, well, we just added this very, very powerful thing called Cast Winter to our project, but um, do we actually trust that all, all of our junior developers understand how this is uh, supposed to be used? We only want to use the, the container from our infrastructure code, so it's nothing that our application code should really understand. 
So, um, so we want to have a rule, we want to define a rule that says if you're writing application code, you shouldn't reference uh, Castle Windsor at all. So you could communicate that as a rule or put that on a wiki or, or something else, uh, but then you'd have to rely on everyone being able to remember that rule. Or you could write an automated test that implements this thing. So this is kind of a different sort of convention. It's a convention that says application code cannot reference Castle Windsor, and we can implement that as an automated test so that if anyone inadvertently bring, breaks that rule, we um, will get a warning about that. So let's see that. So I'll check the next sample out here. So uh, I have a lot of, of unit tests in place already, and one of them is called dependency constraints. It's basically just a, a very, very simple test. It's a blacklist. So we are saying, we have a list of assembly names defined here in inline delta. This is a parameterized test. So I'm just saying, here's a blacklist of things that cannot be referenced in this particular project. So Castle Core and Castle Windsor, two assembly names, can't be referenced. So basically what I'm doing here, I'm just saying, I'm just picking some representative type that sits in this case in my domain model, and that will just be I general in this case. And I'm just picking that assembly and I'm just saying, give me all the reference assemblies from this assembly. And then I'm just gonna loop through all of those and say, if any of those assemblies have a name that matches the name on the, on the blacklist, I'm going to fail this specific test. So if you have this test, this unit test says, sitting um, among all your other unit tests, if you ever inadvertently add a reference to Castle Winsk or Castle Core to your domain model, this test is going to fail. So this is kind of a constraining convention. I've written lots of unit tests like this where I say, here's a rule that has to always be enabled, or here's a rule that, that we really want to need, we really need to know if someone breaks that rule. So that, that would be breaking build. This would actually break the build if anyone does something like that. So it's very nice to have those constraining conventions in place because you don't have to think about them all the time. You just know that they sit there, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, police the, um, the source code for you. So let me move on. So, Given that we um, adopted a TI container to enable some of our conventions, let's see what else we can do. So let's talk about the next problem and see whether we can kind of reduce all this um, very, very complicated container configuration code that we have at the moment. So um, basically, if we had lots of registrations that, that look just like this one, where, where we say, this is just a map, we say, for i quickening, it's implemented by a class called something, whatever. Um, if we just have code like this, this is just a map from, a, uh, from an interface to a concrete class. If we have only those kind of things, it would be pretty simple, because we could just scan assemblies and just say, well, register everything according to the interfaces they implement. Well, unfortunately, we can't do that now because we have other things that actually are more complicated in the way that it needs to be um, defined. So, for example, let's look at this final month view store here. The problem with that is that it takes a directory info and a, and a string as input. And specifically, when we think about strings, a string is kind of like an, an, an it's a very ambiguous type when it comes to dependencies, because in this case it's an extension, so it's meant to be a file extension. Um, but really just the type of string itself doesn't really tell us anything. Um, it might as well have been a connection string or something completely different. A de dependency injection can't really tell just from the type alone that this is supposed to uh, be a file extension name. So we need to explicitly to tell the container what it should do about this extension constructor argument. So we do that by calling into an API called depends on and saying, well, the dependency on the, on the, um, the argument extension should be set to the value txt. 
Uh, we need to do the same thing with the directory again, uh, also because it's ambiguous. So, so because the um, it's difficult for the DI container to actually figure out how to deal with those ambiguous types, we need to explicitly tell them how it works. And this is not something that's uh, unique to Castle Wind. So all the dependency injection containers have problems with um, primitive types. So, um, so we need to, to define some kind of rule that um, enables us to get rid of this. So if we look at how it's actually being used, you will see that every, everywhere where we have an extension, it's being assigned the value of txt. And, and this also happens over in the background worker process where we have even more of those. So I think I have seven or 10 uh, registrations that all look the same. And it's kind of interesting to see that because we almost can hear the outline of a description, you know, a formal description of the rule that applies here, saying whenever you have a string constructor argument with the name of extension, the value should be txt. All right, okay. So that's a rule we can describe with words. You know, and we all developers, we can probably write the code that does that. So instead of writing all those ad hoc configurations, Let's write something that just implements that rule once and for all, so we don't have to think about it anymore. That would make our lives a lot easier. So that's the next thing I want to do. So that's, that's basically this thing about extension by convention. We, we want to create a convention around this extension uh, thing here. So, um, moving forward. Extension by convention. Load the thing back in. And if you're wondering about why I'm shutting down the solution every time, if you ever try to change the code files behind the back of Visual Studio, you get you know tons of pop-ups saying, are you sure you want to reload this to the file? So that's why I'm doing this every time. It's just going to be easier that way. So, um, so what I did now was I actually added a convention called an extension convention and just added that to the container itself. And it's, it's pretty simple to do. You have to understand the extensibility points of the dependency injection container you chose to use. So um, in this case, I'm using something called a sub-dependency resolver. If you were to use some other dependency injection container, you'd have to find this specific extensibility point for that container, um, or find a dependency injection container that actually has extensibility points, not all of them have. Well, anyway. So a sub-dependency resolver in Castle is basically just a thing that says, well, if there's a sub-dependency that requires special attention to be resolved, um, that's the job for a sub-dependency resolver. Sounds kind of reasonable, doesn't it? Okay. So it follows a pattern known in .NET development as the tested doer pattern, which says there's first a method that is being called that returns a boolean, where we ask, can you resolve this specific thing? And actually, the information about what needs to be resolved sits over here saying there's a model about what, what we ask about um, and a model about the dependency we ask about and can this specific sub-dependency resolver actually resolve that? If the answer is false, nothing more is going to happen. Cosmos is just going to move on and, and try to do it in, in different ways. But if the answer is true, this resolve method here will be called. So we're almost done once we understand that. We said the rule was that if we have a dependency of type string that has the name, oh, sorry, that has the name extension, well, then we want to deal with it. So this is the convention that deals with this specific thing. And um, if the answer is true, well, we're just going to return txt, and otherwise we're not going to do anything. That's it. So that's pretty easy. So we just add the, the convention here uh, to, the con to the container. And we'll look at all the manual stuff that is left, and we'll notice that um, all those things that we had about defining the um, the extension property here for the, for example, for the file month view store is now gone. So that takes us halfway towards where we want to be. Now, still looking at the uh, file month view store here, we see that well, we we took care of the extension. Um, but we still have to explicitly talk about this directory info um, dependency here. So it's still being assigned, saying, well, the component of the dependency directory in this case should be assigned a component called view store directory. 
So that's kind of a different uh, thing. It's not that similar, or it's not that dif uh, different from the, the other scenario, but a little bit different. But basically what's happening here, directory info, in case you don't know, is a concrete sealed class. So um, we can't really vary on the type uh, axis here if we want to, to be unambiguous. The problem is we have some ambiguity in the, in the configuration because I have three different directories in place. I have registered a thing uh, for directory info that's called the queue directory, one that's called the SQL source of truth directory, and one called the view store directory. So these are basically, I use files at my persistent store here in this um, demo application. So directories are just the, the databases in the system if you want. And there are three diff different View, uh, persistent stores in this um, system. There's a store for queues. There's a store for the you know the, the actual SQL source of truth, and then we have persistent caches as well. Um, and they're all implemented by putting files uh, on the file system. So um, so we have different directory info components that have different names and they play different roles. But we can't really distinguish on type because type the type is directory info in all three cases. Uh, but they have different names when we register them in the component. Um, the problem is right now that we can't really distinguish um, by the name as we did before because they are all just called directory. Um, but um, what would happen if, for example, I say, instead of just assigning directory to view store directory in this case, let me copy this and change the name of this thing here and say, let's, let's actually call the dependency view store directory. I could go back and just, the first thing I could do was doing this and say, well, let's map the view store, the view store directory to the, to the view store um, directory component. Um, so they kind of match. What would that do to my code? Well, actually would make my code more readable because now I'm explicitly communicating the role of that directory info in the, um, in the constructor of this class. So instead of just asking for any directory info, I'm, not, I'm now, now saying, I want a directory info for the view store directory. Um, so there shouldn't really be any ambiguity left in terms of when we look at that as developers, because we can read and understand English, and we say, oh, that's the view store directory. There's definitely got to be something different than the, you know, the queue directory. So now I have a better idea about the role that this directory info is actually going to play. So, so we actually made, made the code better by trying to introduce some, some sort of convention into this system. And the other benefit that we um, gain from doing this is that now if we, have, if we change the code to be like this all the time, we are beginning to see the contour of a new rule that basically says whenever we encounter a uh, dependency on directory info, Let's just see what the name of that dependency is and just map that to a named component in the container that has the same name. That sounds like a rule we can implement. So let's go ahead, let's go ahead and do that. I'm just going to do, I'm just going to reverse back because it's going to be easier for me when I do, um, when I do git checkout. So, so what we're going to do now is just match directories on the names. That we, um, that we exposed through the constructors. All right, load the application back in. And um, let's see, now we have something called a directory um, convention sitting here. It's still a subdependency resolver. Slightly more complicated, but not by much. We pretty much just say if the target type of the dependency is the type of directory info, then we will deal with that. Otherwise, we won't. And we inject an I kernel into that. That's just a different way of saying a winter container. Um, and we do that from the outside, which means when we actually ask to resolve the directory info, we just say, well, let's just resolve type of directory that sits as the second argument. And the name of the named component should just be the name of the dependency key. So we just say, well, whenever it's a view store directory, I want the named component view store directory of type directory info and so on. So it's just going to do that. So it's just going to match on name um, specifically. 
And if we look at what we have left of uh, manual composition now, there's not a lot of stuff yet um, left now. Um, the file month's view store and all the other things that depended on the directory info and the extension before, they now have this format that we wanted to. This was the thing that we aimed for, saying it's just a map from interface to concrete class. Map from interface to concrete class. So that's where we want, where we want to be. So, um, so this is starting uh, to look pretty good. So let me uh, move on here and see. Since we're now in a position where everything, in the web application at least, is just maps from interfaces to concrete types, why don't we, um, why don't we just scan all the assemblies in our application code and say, well, whenever we encounter a concrete type, let's see which interfaces they, they implement and, um, and just register them against the interfaces that they implement. It's probably going to register a little bit too many things, um, but uh, probably not that many even. So it tends not to be a problem. So um, let's move forward again. And let's see, I want to take something out called composite by convention. All right. So, if we look at the Windsor installer now, I, um, I added this scan, and it basically just says, well, just, uh, that's a bit too much, just take all the assemblies in the directory, in this case the bin folder, because we're in a web application that has a bin folder, oh, and filter by the name of the assembly, so don't pick up just anything, because we will have, like, Castle Windsor would be there, for example, and lots of other assemblies actually got to be in that bin folder. But just scan that folder and pick up any assembly that has a specific um, prefix, in this case, this blur.samples, the booking. So, so that's another little convention in place here, saying if you have a consistent naming convention for your assemblies, um, it's, they're just going to be automatically picked up, and if you if you don't want them to be picked up, you can just name them something else. You don't have to go and explicitly register what should be picked up and what not. You just do that on the naming, so you have a consistent naming convention for your application code, and just just pick every type, uh, every public type in in those assemblies, and just register all of those types against all the interfaces that they implement. So that's just the way that we. This is built in to cast wins of this convention team. We can just scan types and just register them. If there are no, no special requirements on how we should wire them, um, we can just do this. And all the special requirements, we already took care with all those other um, conventions that we already added. So, um, so now if we look at what, what's left in the manual configuration, the only thing that's left now is the configuration of those three um, directories. So think of this as configuration of my three databases. Um, I could have defined conventions around this, uh, but I left them as manual things because I think it's important to point out that even though, though you can really drive this idea about implementing conventions as mechanisms really, really, really far, maybe you don't want to do it for everything because um, creating a new database role in your application is probably an architectural decision and not something that should just happen automatically. Um, we could have defined a convention that just says, well, whenever you see a uh, dependency that has a specific name, we'll just create that, you know, that folder. But that means if a developer ever mistypes the name of a folder, it's going to you know, create a new folder. So we don't want to do that. So I think it's, it's a good idea to still leave some stuff explicitly defined. Uh, because the, it, it um, represents architectural decisions and not just some, you know, not any uh, sort of infrastructure. So that's the only thing I have left, and I'm pretty happy with that. Um, so the, the web application is more or less done now, means it, meaning that I can just keep on adding new classes and new interfaces to the web application, and they're just going to be picked up by all of those conventions that sit here and just be automatically composed together. Um, so we don't really have to think about this more. This just moves into the background, and, and it's nothing that we have to to think about anymore. We can, you know, um, start focusing on writing the code that actually brings value to the business. <laughs>
So um, one more thing left, um, because um, whenever I fast forwarded it and applied those conventions here, I also applied them up at the um, background worker process. So I've applied the same conventions here. Unfortunately, we have one um, challenge left over in the background worker process, and I just want to you know, discuss a different way where we can think about um, applying things, uh, 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 resolving things. So here's the problem. The problem is that um, I have a few components that register themselves against something called I observer of object. And specifically, the two first ones, these dispatchers here, so dispatcher of request reservation command and dispatcher of sold out event. They're kind of special. The other ones here aren't really, so they're, they're not problematic, but these are special. And let's, let's have a look at why they're special. They're special because this is a class that's called Dispatcher of T, and it implements iObserver of object. And um, this tends to be problematic for most DI containers because they don't really understand this, um, or they can't really handle this uh, mapping of a, a generic type to something that's really not generic. Think about I observer of object not being generic because it's already constructed. It's not generic anymore um, because it's already being constructed into I observer of object. Um, so the thing is here that, I mean, if it had been I observer of T, so mapping dispatcher of T to I observer of T would have been not problematic at all. But the problem is that we map dispatcher of T to I observer of object. So no matter what the T is, it already implement, it always, always implements I observer of object. Um, so that's, that's difficult for a DI container to figure out because um, which, which dispatches of T's should it actually define. Um, so the, the reason why we have this thing here is um, we, have a, um, we have a persistent queue where we have messages going back and forth. And when messages are being deserialized, there is a certain point along this deserialization process where we don't know the type of the message yet. It's actually the role of the dispatcher to figure out what's the, what's the type of the message. And the way that this happens is it wraps around something called an I consumer of T, and it basically just says, well, when, if the value that arrives here is of type T, I'll, I'm going to invoke this. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a cost, and I'm going to invoke this consumer of T, which is strongly type. Um, so, um, not going into too much detail here, but the problem is if we don't register any dispatches for the messages that move around in our system those messages will actually be lost. So we have to figure out a way to, to, um, to, to understand which messages are actually moving around in the system. And it turns out that we have this um, iConsumer of T interface that can, indirectly, it can tell us. So if we look at who implements this um, iConsumer of T, there are two classes. This is only demo code, so we don't have many, but typically we would have many more. So this month view updater here implements iConsumer of sold out event. Sold out event is a message. And we also have a different implementation of iConsumer of T um, called capacity gate. It implements iConsumer of request reservation command. So when we look through the code, I don't know if you saw that I can almost mechanically go through and find all the I consumers and, and figure out which messages are actually existing in the system. And the only thing I really want to do, with, the only thing that's left now is I say, I want to register those. Then I can really register those just by scanning, just like I did before. But whenever I see one of those, I also need to register a dispatcher of the same message type. So it's kind of like, it has to be a side effect when, whenever I understand or whenever the container scans and registers those consumers of T's, it needs to register a dispatcher of the same T as a side effect. So uh, do a convention based on a side effect uh, or implement a convention as a side effect or something. That's, that's a little bit different, so let's, let's see what that would look like. So dispatches by convention, that's the only thing that we really need to do now. Um, get to check out dispatches by convention. Right, okay. Um, so let's see where, whether we can find the 
install here again. So this convention is a little bit different because it's not a sub-dependency resolver. It doesn't address the um, the um, it, it doesn't address how to resolve a subsystem. What we need to do is we need to register one type as a side effect of registering another type. We can do that by hooking into a, an event called hardware registered and basically do it like this. So, hardware registered is just an event on um, the container and it gives us a, um, an ha a handler that talks about what kind of thing is being registered. And the component model it contains information about the type that's currently being registered. So that might, for example, be month view update. So it contains information about the month view update class or the capacity gate class or something else. So basically what we want to do here, from that component model, we want to get all the services. So the services are the interfaces being implemented like I consumer of sold out event or I consumer of request reservation command or something else. And we should keep in mind there might be more than one interface implemented by a class. So it's a collection. So basically we just filter that collection and say, is this, an, is this an interface? And is, is it generic? And if it is, is the generic type definition the type of I consumer? If it is, we know now that we can get the generic type argument out of that one and there will only be one, and that's going to be our message type. So, um, so we basically just figure out, in this case, there's a message called sold out event, or there's a message called request reservation command. And um, there might be more interfaces implemented here. We just look through that and say, for each of those, we register against iObserver of object this dispatcher of that specific type, we call the generic type here. So that just registers one thing as a side effect of another. And now if we go back and look at the um, Windsor installer, um, we should be in the position where we just have all of those um, four implemented by, four implemented by, just as we had before. So um, we are now in a state where we can apply the same kind of, of scanning as we did with the previous one. So that's the last thing I'm going to do. I'm just going to register all services by convention, just like I did in the web application before. So I'll fast forward one last time. Um, and anyone? There we go. And now, when we look at the installer, I have a scan that looks very similar to the one that I had before. I'm just scanning the, um, the assembly here. Um, it's defined a little bit differently. I have to um, not pick everything, but specifically fill out dispatcher of T because I have special handling of that. But apart from that, it's basically the same thing as before. I've just registered everything against the services that they implement. And if we look at the manual uh, stuff that's left, um, we should see, just like before, we only have those explicit things that we explicitly care about, those three database um, configurations. And everything else is just being you know, implemented or picked up by this set of conventions that we've defined here. So these are the set, this is the set of conventions. And um, this means also in the the background worker process, I can just keep on adding types, interfaces and concrete types to various assemblies and they're just automatically going to be composed as, um, as defined by those things here. So I don't really have to touch this code anymore. This just moves into the background and becomes infrastructure code that, you know, not even every team member needs to understand what's going on here as long as they understand the conventions that are uh, being, um, being used here. They don't have to, to understand the specific details. So, um, don't have much time, but there's a lot of other things we can do with, um, with conventions. Uh, there's a guy called Greg, Greg Young who did a little um, proof of concept called Grand Sysnit in uh, Norwegian. I hope I got that right, Hans. Right? It, it pretty much means, means interface. So that's a, a way where you can go and, um, and do interface-based uh, or protocol-based specifications uh, using unit tests uh, for everything that implements an interface. Um, you can also do a lot of things with a uh, thing that I um, um, have any, any stake in, something called autofix, which is kind of interesting. Don't talk about that. Uh, that. So basically, just uh, summing up here, um, you want to have consistent code, 
And um, if you don't have any kind of mechanism in place, you need to enforce this consistency by manually doing reviews. And I'm not against doing reviews at all, but if you can, you, if you can help your developers follow specific conventions just by enabling things, um, you'd probably be um, in a position where you can have much more consistent code. So, um, so keep in mind here, I'm not talking about coding standards or anything that's just being communicated verbally or, or through text. This is actually mechanisms that, that, that we implement using real code. Um, and basically I'm saying, think about this, try to flip a mental switch and say, if you can describe a convention as a rule, you can probably implement it as code. Um, you developers, right, so you know how to code. Uh, so don't just describe it to your fellow developers. Put it down there in the code and make it available so that it's, it just works. That would be very nice. So, um, so that's it. My name is Mark Seaman. Um, if you want to contact me or ask me questions, um, I'll be around for the next couple of hours. Otherwise, I have a blog and a Twitter handle where you can contact me. I also have this book that you heard about before where we read more about dependency injection if you're interested in, in understanding how containers work and the role that they play in applications. So um, I don't think we have much time for questions though, but uh, we, have, we have a few, okay? So, um, any questions? I'll, I'll let the, this gentleman here actually control my time then. Hello? Yeah. I have a question. Uh, don't you afraid uh, that implementation of uh, those rules into code would just increase uh, one dot uh, and uh, more problems? So, I'm afraid whether it could increase, I'm sorry, I didn't give it like that. More dirty hacks in order to avoid those conventions. So, more hacks to avoid those conventions. Yes. All right, so when, if you develop on a project like this, you basically have two options. Either you follow the convention, in which case your code is just going to automatically work, or you don't follow those conventions, in which case you have to do a lot more work to actually you know, get your specific and very special code to be picked up and composed into your application. Which means, again, that you need to understand how the infrastructure works. So I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, I can never protect myself against, you know, people who want to do hacks. But I would say there is, a, um, there is an incentive to follow the conventions because it's just less work that you have to do. Um, but my, I wouldn't really be worried um, in terms of the architecture, I mean, if I were worried about hacks, it was because I would be worried about specific team members, blah, blah. Okay, is that a reasonable answer? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, did you try, does it make sense to um, implement all coding standards in a set of rules that will automatically check uh, how it was like the name, the standards, and uh, maybe, for example, uh, exceptions, maybe much would be processed in some place, so does it make sense to make coding standards as available as rules? I think I think it depends on what type of coding standard it is, because you might have you might have a rule that says whenever you have a private field in the class, you will have you know some people like to have m underscore something. I think it's not a good idea, but never mind. Um, but you might have a rule like that. It's kind of difficult to write a, you know, a unit test as a constraining convention that checks for this because you really have to go very deep into to reflection if you want to do that. And there are already tools that do that, like FX carbon code analysis. So I'd say just stick with those things um, for those types of things. So for conventions, I'm more thinking about those active things that need to be implemented to actually compose the application and make it work. Um, so it's not for everything, it's for some things. Okay? One more question. One more question. If any. Very, very much. <laughs> no more questions? All right. Okay, well, that's done.